we're in a great day. Uh, you hear every, every, you hear it from all over the place, and we understand it. We believe it. We are moving into a great awakening, <clears throat> like the world's greater than the world's ever seen. It's going to affect nations. Uh, great outpouring of God's glory. It sure is. The Lord said, uh, when the people of Israel rejected him and everything, he said, but I'll tell you this, as surely as I live, saith the Lord, the whole earth shall be filled with my glory. I believe we're in that generation for that to happen. And, uh, of course, we know that it comes through the church. So God has to prepare us. He's preparing us as a church to be bold, to be strong. Audrey's message last week was right on target. And uh, to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, he made it very clear that if you're going to live in righteousness, you will be persecuted. And, uh, but then he said something very powerful. He said, but rejoice when that happens. Why? Because he says, great is your reward in heaven. That's the whole purpose of being on this earth is to glorify the Lord Jesus Christ <clears throat> that we overcome by what? The blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, and we do not love our life even unto the death. That's the whole, that's the whole thing. I thank God that we're in a country that we are blessed and uh, we can, can meet like this in a nice building, nice soft chairs. Um, we have heat in the winter and air conditioning in the summer. I mean, I like that. <clears throat> but what I like even more is what God's doing with this church. There's a remnant of people, the Gideon's army, and you've been hearing this over and over and over, and, and even uh, last week, a Sunday night, that Audrey ministered on that. There's some conditions to be met that America has not grown accustomed to. To carry the great gospel of Jesus Christ means that you, you, you have to live a surrendered life. You have to literally come to the place where Paul said that uh, my life's not even dear to me. I don't, I don't live to please Paul. I, I live to serve the Lord to preach this great gospel to as many people as I can and win as many people as I can to the Lord. And I was reading, uh, I read about where Paul got saved. I read all the rest of the, of the uh, book of Acts, Friday, I think it was. I just wanted to follow Paul on his journey. And um, Paul's journey was, he was beaten five times. He was stoned. He was imprisoned. He was shipwrecked, floating out in the sea. What an amazing journey. Everywhere he went, the Judaizers and the Jews stirred up the crowd against him. He would go into a city he would have revival and riot, both at the same time. Why? Because he was bringing the kingdom of God into the kingdom of, and exposing the kingdom of darkness. Paul was so anointed that it said that uh, handkerchiefs would come off of his body. His body was so full of God, his body, that people would be healed. Demons would leave just because of the, the anointing that was on his body a body that had been uh, beaten, tortured, shipwrecked, imprisoned, and his body had to be a wreck. But only God supernaturally sustained that man. Nobody could go through what he did and live. In a physical body could, especially when they stoned him. I think they really killed him. Drug him outside of the city. Next thing you know, the disciples are standing around him, and he just gets up. Walks back into the city. He was delivered in jail. The angel, you know, the earthquake comes and all of his fetters come off. 
leads the jailer and his family to the Lord. Um, saw a man in a vision, Macedonia, and says, come over here. So he goes over there and gets beaten and put in prison. Most of us in America that are ministers, so to speak, when we go to places, we have these conferences and everything's nice and comfortable and we make sure that it's in a nice building, the seating is all good and everything. And we walk out of that and go home and everything's good. Nobody's beating us up. Nobody's putting us in prison. I was thinking about this where God, you know, um, Paul said, Lord, three times, can you take this demon that's been assigned to me by Satan? Can you, can you take this away? And Jesus said, no, nah, I won't do it because my grace is sufficient for you. Paul made a powerful statement. He said, now here's, here's the deal. I learn that in my weakness, in my flesh, there's not anything in me that can do anything for God. Therefore, I'll boast in my weakness, my inability to do anything, so that the power of Christ can rest upon me. And the word rest upon me there is in the old covenant when the Shekinah glory rested upon the temple. And Paul, knowing that we now are the temple of God, what he was saying is, I have got to boast in one thing, Christ. I have got to make known to everybody that it's Christ that does all of his work through me. Because see, Paul was, uh, he said uh, that he was puffed up. And he said, so that I don't get puffed up in myself, there's been an assignment against him from Satan to keep him from being puffed up. And he wasn't happy about it. I wouldn't be either. I mean, everywhere you go to preach, all of a sudden they're dragging you out, trying to stone you. Riots are outside, yelling, screaming. He didn't go from Hilton Hotel to Hilton Hotel. Has his Learjet so that he can keep his anointing. I'm not joking. There's a lot of ministries that they say that. Oh, I've got to keep my anointing. Are you kidding me? (laughs) See what it cost Paul to walk in the anointing, to walk in the spirit, because that's what I'm going to talk about, walking and living in the spirit. Paul came, and when he got saved, he met Jesus. Bright cloud, heard the Lord speak to him. But man, when he got saved, he got saved. And he became just as radical for Jesus as he was being against him. Because he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. He had an encounter with the risen Lord. The bright light of Christ shined upon him and he had that encounter with God changed his life forever. And Paul uh, was whisked away. We know that he was let down in a basket because they were plotting to kill him. But he went into, uh, according to Galatia, he went for like 14 years. He was not known to the church. He was separated to God. And it says that the Lord Jesus himself gave him the revelation of the gospel. He wrote about 57% of the New Testament. And he said, the revelation I got was from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I didn't receive it from any man. I received it. So think about this. God, the Lord Jesus took Paul away for about 14 years and personally by the spirit or maybe Jesus face to face, however it was, it was by the Holy Ghost, and taught him what we read in this New Testament. So then Paul, when he came out of that, he said he went to Jerusalem to the elders there and the apostles to make sure that he was preaching the gospel. And when he shared with him what the gospel was by, that the Lord had given him, 
He said, they gave me the right hand of fellowship. In other words, they said, yeah, Paul, you're preaching the gospel. That's the, that's the gospel. Paul was so powerful about the gospel, he said, if any man or any angel preach any other gospel, let them be anathema. In other words, let them be, dis- let them be um, destroyed forever. That's what that word means. He was jealous over the gospel. He was jealous for it. He said, I will not adulterate the gospel like other people do by preaching it for money, making their name famous, bending the, the gospel to, 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 to whatever reason. He was jealous for the Lord Jesus Christ and the gospel. He was jealous for his God. And the reason he could do that because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The only way he could do it, he could, was filled with the Holy Spirit. So Paul, all those years, finally at the Philippians 3, you get to the place where Paul says, you know, I've not walked in all of this. I've not attained all of this yet. See, Paul did not walk in all the revelation that was given to him. You got to understand that. It was revelation to him, and he walked in it. He walked in the word of the Lord, which became scripture. And Paul said, I haven't obtained all of this yet, but I keep pressing on to the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I keep pressing on, forgetting those things that lay behind. What does that mean? Well, you know, if you were beaten 39 lashes minus one five times, you could have a tendency to get bitter. See, we in America, God doesn't answer our prayer right away, and we just say, well, fooey, I'm not going to serve God. He didn't bless me. You were blessed in heavenly places the day you got born again. You were blessed with every spiritual blessing the minute you got born again. So God is moving us to himself to be a people like-minded with the Apostle Paul and being like-minded with one another. So I looked at that in the book of Acts. Of course, I read the book of Acts all the time. We are a chapter of the book of Acts. I don't know if we're the last one or not. We might be. But what is the book of Acts? It's the power of the Holy Spirit working through his church on earth to glorify the Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and bring much fruit to our Father. And we're in the kingdom of God, and God is moving us from a church culture to a kingdom culture. Most of the church is caught up in the church culture. But God is drawing Gideon's army out to himself so that his kingdom can be made manifest in our midst. Multitudes will come to Christ. Signs, wonders, and miracles like we've never seen before because Christ himself will have a body, a bride that is totally his, totally possessed by the Holy Spirit, full of the Father's love so so he can be manifested on earth as in heaven, changing cities, changing nations, changing regions because the kingdom of God begins to come in power causing uh, evil rulers to either repent or be totally removed. Doesn't matter. Either way, they're going to come down. Some of them will get saved. We got to remember mercy and judgment. I'm not mad at anybody. I don't have malice towards anybody. I had to guard my heart on that. Because those who don't receive Christ have a Christless future, eternally, separated from God. And we're on this earth to reconcile them to God. So when you pray for those in authority over us, 
I pray it this way. Lord, I have great compassion for them to be saved. On the other hand, I pray against their wickedness. I pray against the wickedness that they're trying to bring, not only in America, but throughout the whole earth. Because it's demonized. It's Satan-driven. Because there's, there, there are those that are going to walk with the devil. There's those going to walk with God. And then there's those caught in the middle. They're not really walking with the devil or God. They're just, they're just human beings going around life. But the evil leaders of the world are demonized. They're Satan's prophets. They're Satan's voice. But we're God's voice. We're God's prophets and prophetesses. We are oracles of God. They are oracles of the devil. And we, listen, we don't listen to them. I hope you don't. But their lies are out there every day. Because Jesus said this about the devil. He was a liar from the beginning. He's the father of lies. But our father is the father of truth. And that truth abides in us by the Holy Spirit. We are made in the image and likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. But you've got to understand something. Paul said, he said, I want to know the power of his resurrection. But I also want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. I also want to know what it is to be conformed to his death so that the power of the resurrection can work in my life. It's an automatic deal. If we seek the kingdom first, God will take care of you. Amen. He'll bless you. He, whatever you have need of, he knows. He'll, give, he'll bless you with it. If you need a house, he'll bless you with a house or a car, whatever it takes. He don't have no problem with that. But when that's what you seek before him, then you're in the wrong place. Then as a church, you're not the church acting like the church and for in America the church is a bunch of big babies Amen. and if we're not careful you and I could be one of them you know when you point at somebody it's an old saying there's three fingers pointing back at you and the way we can help our brothers and sisters is to be everything God wants you to be. And you lead by example. Not by condemning or preaching or trying to straighten them out. But just keep your mouth shut. It says that the servants of the Lord shall not be quarrelsome. But shall be able to just give a witness to somebody of what Christ is in your life. Only the Holy Spirit can put Christ in somebody else. You can't. But what you can do is share the good news. And when you do that, then the Holy Spirit backs that up and touch hearts and change hearts. Your attitude can stop the work of the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you're telling the truth. You can beat somebody with this and they'll never come to Christ. They might try and live by the letter of the law that you're trying to pound them with. Then they become self-righteous or they become condemned. But when you live this by the Holy Spirit and you and I are living epistle of this word, then we have wisdom from the Spirit and the love from the Spirit to be able to know how to impart grace to that person. It takes a dead person to impart grace. What do you mean? I mean, the old man has to die. The old man cannot impart grace to anything, not even yourself. He's dead. He's on the cross. So what am I saying? You've got to be dead to sin, alive unto God in Christ Jesus. Are you listening? So if you really are concerned about somebody, you have to have the concern of the spirit for that person 
that they need Jesus, they need the Father, and by the way, he loves them just as much as he loves you. He's causing it to rain on the just and the unjust. Christ died for every human being yeah. on this earth. Amen. And when you see somebody, they need Jesus, you've got to remember he shed his blood for that person. I don't care how wicked they are. They can turn. Yes. Some of them won't. There are those that are rep reprobate. God's turned them over because they've, they've, re they've rejected and rejected and rejected the spirit. But that's not for you and I to determine. There are those that will never turn to God. There are those even that uh, uh, will, will curse him when he comes. Why? Because their heart is hardened. There's people's hearts like Pharaoh. They're not going to turn. They're not. The more God shows up, the more evil they're going to get. But there are those who are even maybe the most wretched person that can get saved. But they need a church that's living the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. They need a church filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. They need a church that's living in the Spirit and walking in the Spirit. See, it's one thing, we're all born again. We, when we get saved, we're living, we're in the Spirit, and the Spirit's in us. But Paul said, if you live in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit. And the word walk there means that your life, you're walking in line with the Holy Spirit. Your life is responsive to the Holy Spirit. Your life is controlled by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was controlled by the Holy Ghost. And he set an example for us. Not to follow, now listen to me, you try and follow the example of Jesus without the Holy Spirit, you can't do it. But, so what do we follow? We follow by the Spirit. So I do want to qualify that. Do I follow him? Yes, because the Holy Spirit leads me to be like him. So as I obey the Holy Spirit, I will be walking in the flesh like Jesus walked in the flesh in the flesh and blood body. He made, gave an example for us to what a real spirit-filled, God-fearing human being looks like. Jesus was heard for his godly fear. The anointing of the fear of the Lord was upon him, and it says the fear of the Lord was his delight. Why? Because he reverenced and feared his father. Therefore, he could say, I only do what my father shows me. And I think Paul could say, I only do what the Lord shows me. He's supposed to go into Asia. The Spirit of the Lord said no. Then he's going to go somewhere else. The Spirit of Jesus said no. Then he has that dream. Come to Macedonia. He goes over there and gets the daylights beat out of him. But God showed up. I think we need to be everything the blood of Jesus purchased for us to be. We have the backbone of Jesus Christ. We have the same backbone that was in the Apostle Paul and the early church. Every apostle was martyred except John. And John was on the Isle of uh, Patmos in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, in the spirit, I used to think, and, you know, yeah, we're worshiping God and we're in the spirit at that moment. Well, that's a true statement, but there's, there's more meaning in that. Than John lived in the spirit. Because he lived in the spirit, he had a revelation of Christ. He had a revelation of the future that we could read. See, when you live in, in, in Christ Jesus, you live in the spirit, you will have revelation of Jesus. You have revelation of things to come. The Bible says that one of the things the, the uh, Holy Spirit does, Jesus said, he leads and guides us into all truth, and he shows us things to come. I've had a lot of prophetic things the Lord has shown me. I've never shared, probably never will. But I've watched them come to pass. And some of them right now are coming to pass that the Lord showed me years ago. You say, why don't you prophesy? Because I don't want to. God never told me to. I do not want to be on the prophet list. Thank you very much. Now, if God told me to, I would, but I don't want that. I want to live out the prophetic word. I want to watch it come to pass, and I'm watching it come to pass. 
And if the Lord, like last Sunday night, falls on me and I begin to prophesy, praise God. We've got to learn as a church, experience this, to live in the Spirit and to obey Him, to walk in Him. Our life's controlled in conduct and, and, and everything that we do controlled by the Holy Spirit because we live in the Spirit, the Spirit's in us, and now let's walk in the Spirit. Let's let the Spirit control our life. What's he going to do? He's going to make sure that you're rooted and grounded in this word. And he's going to make sure that if persecution ever comes, it's already here in the United States. You know that, don't you? We're losing our, our uh, First Amendment rights. You say, you say the wrong thing, you're gone off of all these little big tech things. But see, big tech's getting, run, getting ready to run into God. You've got to understand this, church. We bring God's rule on this earth. Amen. We're not here to play church. We're here to be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, to be a voice of God into our community, into our workplace, wherever we are. We are to release that power of God in our lives that's in there by the Holy Ghost. You say, why don't we see more signs and wonders and miracles? Because we don't see that many people walking with the Spirit. One signs, wonders, and miracles for the wrong reasons. Have miracles, we'll travel. Well, my ministry's really going to flow now. Now, those, you want a guy that's walking with God, you start following Mario Murillo. That man is sparking a revival in California. Yes, yes. Dorothy's trying to tell me you ought to go out there and just sit in that tent for two or three days. I may do that. I get a minister with Mario Morello in March. We'll get a show of that. I'll probably get saved. <laughs> <laughs> I followed Mario Morello clear back in the 70s when he used to come to Melody Land and preach. That young man and now a guy, little, probably a little younger than I am, but, but man, he's on fire with God. Always has been. Never compromised. See, being big don't make you great, but being great will make you big in God's eyes. God needs every one of his people to come in line with the Holy Spirit because each one of you are called for purpose and destiny. The revelation God gives you, like Audrey said last week, the revelation God gives you is for purpose. We have Bible studies all over the United States. Feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. In the United States, the average Christian has at least two Bibles. At least two Bibles. But now you can get on your phone, and man, you can just do anything on there with the Bibles. It's awesome. But the sad note is, probably most of those Bibles have dust on them. Or they're relegated to a little devotional. Please, I'm not getting on you. Don't stop doing your devotional. But there's something greater that God wants us to do, and that's to live by this word. And you can't live by something you don't meditate on. Well, let, me, let me qualify that. You do live by what you meditate on. And if your mind is more set on the things of the world, that's where your heart's going to be. That's what you're meditating on. You ought, to, you ought to take a test sometime, starting in the morning, and write down throughout the day what you're thinking about. And at the end of the day, look back at the day and see what you were thinking about the most. And don't be super spiritual, oh, I'm thinking about Jesus all day. Give me a break, you are not. Now, some of you might be. 
But what is the proof to me that you are thinking about Jesus? It's the fact that you're more like him than anybody I've run into. The, what is it? The proof of the pudding is in the eating? I really believe this, church, that you can recognize a man or a woman who's walking very, very close to God because the presence of God is with them. There's something about them. When you get around them, they're going to make you think about Jesus. They're going to, you're going to, they may even ever, never even mention his name. And yet there's something about him that just starts touching you. Why? Because the presence of Christ is manifest with them. The fragrance of Christ. You can't drum that up. It's out of a relationship that the Holy Spirit has been given to us to bring us into that relationship of Jesus. See, to be in the Spirit is where you're in a place of a constant revelation of who Jesus is. He reveals himself more and more and more. And listen to me. The more you see him by revelation, the more you become like him. This is good news, church. You ought to be, but I know it's going deep because I'm not ministering to your soul. I'm not ministering to your brain. I'm ministering to your spirit. Your spirit belongs to God. Every memory of your spirit is by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the memory of your new man. When you got born again, you received Christ. Old things passed away. All things become new. All things are of God. So the Holy Spirit in your spirit only knows God. Your spirit does not know the world. Your spirit doesn't contact the world. Your spirit is contacting with God. But we couldn't contact the world through our soul and our body. So our soul has to be transformed, but it's the, it's the spirit of our mind that's transformed. Not your natural mind. You have, your natural mind is going to keep working. You've got a job. You've got things. You got, that's not going to go away, but... We are renewed, not in our natural mind, but in the spirit of your mind. That comes out of your spirit. So that you have, spiritually, the mind of Christ. Which can override your natural way of thinking. But that only comes by spending time with him. You say, oh, I don't have time. Really? Let's see, what... Do I make a list of what you do have time for? Well, I have time for, oh, yeah. I've got time for sports. I've got time for news. I've got time for my Facebook. But I don't have time for Jesus. Are you kidding me? That's the problem. The presence you live in is the presence you get out, give out from. If you walk in a perfume factory, you're going to walk out of there smelling really good, right? Because you're in that environment. Well, we're in the environment of the kingdom of God. Church, we're in the kingdom. He came to bring the atmosphere of heaven to earth through his church. So we're, we're to live in the Spirit and walk in the Spirit. Because you got born again, you were, you were living by the Spirit. Spirit of God brought the, the, right, the, the resurrection of Christ in you. But we can be living by the Spirit and not walking in the Spirit. Our, our lives in line with the Holy Spirit. Now, does that make us perfect? No, it makes us gives God the ability to perfect us, change us from glory to glory. And come at the end of our day like Paul says, you know what, I haven't attained it all yet. You know why? Because I'm not just like, totally like Christ yet. And that's going to happen when we get to heaven. Because then we'll have a resurrected body. Hallelujah. He'll have all the fullness of Christ. And the good news about heaven is the dead man is dead. He doesn't go there. So when we get to heaven, you'll stop arguing with God. You'll quit trying to tell God how to do things. You won't get to heaven and tell him how to run the universe. Thank you very much. He ain't going to ask your advice. He doesn't need anything of your own wisdom. 
He wants to impart to you his wisdom. He wants to impart to you the mind of Christ so that we think alike with God. I know that we all have traumatic things in our life. It can be our health. It can be losing a a loved one. It could be maybe you're really struggling financially. You're struggling physically. But I'm going to tell you right now, those things should not stop you from being filled and walking in the Holy Ghost. I just have to measure myself with what Jesus went through and with what Paul went through. And yet, you know, God put Paul in prison where he could write the gospel. There wasn't a Hotel Hilton where you could order in your catered food because I've got to be in a place where I can be spiritual. Listen, God doesn't always make it comfortable for your flesh. I think of Mary, little what? They think probably about it around a 16-year-old girl. Bearing the Son of God. Now you would think that God would put him in one of these queen's things with the servants carrying her and keeping her fan and keeping her comfortable. And then when it was time to give birth to, to, to his son, then, then all the best midwives would come and make her comfortable and have this little baby and lay him in a palace and No, dear Lord, she had to ride 70 miles on the back of a donkey in her last month of pregnancy. Now, I don't know what that'd be like, but you ladies would certainly say, dear Lord, that's the last thing I'd want to do. (laughs) Right? She didn't have a Le Mans class. She didn't have a, a, uh, a, a saddle block thing in her back to stop all the pain. She didn't have a doctor. She didn't even have a midwife. She was born, as we know, in a stable. And her husband, who had delivered sheep, delivered her son and cut that cord and tied it up. And here's a 16-year-old girl, I don't know how old Joseph was, in a stable. That's the son of God. Now listen to me. You carry Christ in your flesh, just like Mary did, only in a different way. And so what I'm going to say to you, you've got to have ears to hear this. He doesn't make it easy on your flesh. Now, sickness is disease, that's not God. God wants us all healed. I believe that power is coming here. We're going to keep praying for it. We're going to call out for it. We're going to cry out for it. We're going to say, God, it has to come. I want to see Oscar. I want to see all these people healed. So does God. He wants to see him more than we do. But what I'm saying is this. You may have to suffer some things in the flesh for the gospel of Jesus Christ. You may have family members that don't like you because you're Dingy, this religious thing back here. It can split families. It can split marriages. Maybe one's a believer, maybe one's an unbeliever. All of a sudden, you got to decide, who am I going to walk with? Dorothy and I have had a few times when we had to sacrifice a lot of things to follow God. And Dorothy's been a little trooper. I put my wife in position with three little kids and no food. One bottle left for our little baby. That's it. Nothing else. No money. No food. She never wavered. Not one bit. Not one bit. She gave a testimony one time in our church. It was a ladies' deal. Her, her, well, her mom and dad was there. And she gave the testimony of what we went through in California and stuff. And her dad sat there and started weeping. 
He said, sissy, why didn't you tell me? Why didn't you tell me? Because we never made anybody, nobody, we let them know our needs, not our own family. We determined our God would take care of us. And he did. He did. Dorothy made us so special. We'd take our girls out to this little park. Cost 50 cents to get into. Had a little pet in school. We would go out there and Dorothy would have sandwiches made and stuff. And that's only, we could take our girls out there for 50 cents. And they could pet the little goats and stuff. And we'd have a picnic. And, and uh, she made her birthday special for them. And some of the kids that Tanya and them was having birthday parties with, their dads were uh, uh, part of gangs, on drugs. And our kids was in that environment. And we ultimately led uh, everybody in that whole apartment complex to the Lord, except for one guy named Rabbit. <laughs> he um, was a neat guy. Church, we have got to be determined to set your face and your heart to say, God, I am totally yours. And what part of me is not yours, change it. It takes courage to understand the love of God, he is so deeply in love with me, a love that we can't even, we have to experience it, we get a measure of it, that you can go to him, I'm talking about my, I can go to him and expose to him my deepest sins that's against him. Now, I'm not out there doing crazy stuff. That's not what I'm talking about. But church, I'm telling you, if you think your heart is perfect before God, just let God examine it. You've got to love him enough to let him do it. Because see, some people won't do it because they're afraid that God won't like you anymore. But guess what? He already knows what's in your heart. He knew what was in there before you ever born. And that's the reason he came, to heal us, heal the brokenhearted, fill us with himself. You see, what, here's what happens to us. Whatever I hold back from God, it's a matter of the fact that I don't trust God. And then I try and fix in me the only thing that he can fix in me. Are you listening? We have to share with him what's broken so he can fix it. That's what the Holy Spirit does. See, a lot of people won't step out and, and obey God because they don't trust him. Also, they have a fear of man. Well, what do people think? I don't care. What does he think? Because he's not thinking about what they think. He's thinking about what you're thinking. Set your mind to follow the Holy Ghost. And I'm not talking about feelings. Sometimes we don't feel like serving God. But that's not the new man. And if we enter into the feeling, we'll miss the power of the Holy Ghost to change that feeling and fill us with joy. Then you ought to be excited. You ought to be excited. God says, I'm making you into my image and likeness. I've sent my spirit to put in you and bring into you everything the blood of my son purchased. But see, in fear, we hold on to the old. Why? Because we're selfish. Well, that went over big, didn't it? What I'm saying is this, what I don't let go of to God is because I like myself more than letting self be crucified and let God take place of that old self. Am I making sense? I want Oscar healed. And so does God. And I believe so do all of us. 
And I'm not going to play the game of, well, why isn't he healed? Because when you do that, you're going to start questioning God. Then you're going to get discouraged. Then you're going to get upset with God. And that's not going to help Oscar. What's going to help Oscar is we get united in our faith for this man. Amen. For everybody in here that needs healing, get, our, get united with God. Get united with God's plan and purpose. And have bold enough to say, God, whatever part of me is not serving you, kill it. It's already dead. Deaden it into me. God forbid that any of us would think we're perfect. God forbid that any of us would think, oh, I've got it all now. There's no more that God can show me. How dumb can you breathe, like Andrew says, and still live? And the good news is, he's given us everything that pertains unto life and godliness. Mm -hmm. All of his promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Oh, church, we're getting ready to experience the greatest presence of God you've ever known. And when this starts happening, and it's already happening, God will fascinate you more than anything the world ever had to fascinate you with. God will be your fascination. When revivals come, people just all of a sudden, they're not, they're, they're, God is there. They're, they're, they can't wait to get together. You get a coal miner like in Wells, you know, that, I don't know how hard, that would be a hard, dirty, dangerous job. Those men would go to work, come home, clean up, eat supper, go to the revival meeting until about 4 or 5 the next morning. They'd go and lay. They said they'd have about an hour before the sun came up sometime. They'd lay there and about an hour and rest. They'd get up, eat breakfast, go to work, come home, clean up, go to the revival. How can you do that? The Spirit of God. They testified. One person wrote down about these coal miners. Can you imagine how rugged they would look? He said, yet here were these men with faces that looked like angels. They shined. They were, they were radically changed by the Holy Ghost. Think about it. Oh, we're in for some good things. We're in for an awesome time. Amen. Though the fig tree isn't blossoming, Though there's no cattle in the stall, there's no nothing, yet I will praise the Lord. Because I'm not praising him for what I have or don't have in the natural. I'm praising him for what I have in the spiritual. I have him. And though the mountains fall in the sea and the seas roar, I will not fear. Why? Because my eyes are on him, not the circumstances. Job made a statement. This is a, this is a faith statement. It's not, but he said, though he slay me, yet I will serve him. Now, you say, well, that's not grace. I'm not talking about grace. That's not faith. I'm not talking about faith. I'm talking about commitment. Job didn't even know God like we do. But here's a man who says, you know, even if he slays me, I will serve him. And here we are. I won't go into where we are <laughs> because we don't have that kind of commitment. Our commitment is if he doesn't bless me, I won't serve him. If he blesses me, I'll serve him. If he heals me, I'll serve him. No, you won't. No, you won't. You know why? Because that's selfish. Selfish. Our life has to come to the place that says, I no longer live, but Christ liveth in me. So, Lord, go ahead and live your life. And by the way, as he lives his life in us, we'll run into ourselves every once in a while. Because he's exposing that which he wants to change. And the good news is, let's let him do it. 
Here's a church culture. I know I'm going long, but you've got to hear some things. Here's a church culture. Well, they won't let my gifts flow in that church. Well, they won't let me do this. I don't know why they don't know I'm so anointed. Well, I can't do this. I don't know what's going on with me. I'm just going to go find another church. That's a church culture. And you're trapped in it because you think your gifting is what God's after and he's not. He's after your heart. And when he has your heart, your gift will operate. In my life, I made a determine years ago, I don't ask people for me to come preach in their church. I don't. And yet, opportunities open up to me. Because I determined when I started the ministry, God, if I never preach anymore, I don't care. You say, oh, my God, you're not called. Are you kidding me? I remember the students I went with in Melody Land. Oh, they were chomping. We've got to go out and preach and preach. And I just looked at them and said, aren't you excited? I said, no. I don't think you're called. Really? I said, I don't care. If God tells me to preach, I'll preach. If he tells me not to, I won't. I don't care about whether I preach or not. I care about knowing Jesus and walking with him. Yes. And I want to tell you right now, 90% of those guys are no longer in the ministry. You know why? Because they misplaced. They wanted to be a shining star. Well, guess what? The star burned out. If the Lord told me this very moment to never preach again, I wouldn't preach again. I'm telling you the truth. Dorothy knows this. I, I, I'm bear witness to my own conscience. I would, I would never open my mouth and preach again if he said not to. Now, he's not going to say that. Are you, Lord? No, because he sent me to preach and to teach. But my whole trust is in Jesus. If he told me to walk away from everything and just spend time with him, I'd do it. I'm serious. Dorothy knows I'm serious. Because I want to do one thing on this earth. I want to glorify Jesus. I want to honor him. No matter if nothing goes out here like I think it should. My life is hid in Christ to the best that I know. And I know a lot of it that's not there yet. I have enough sense to know that not all of it's there yet. And you can, anything you want to say, well, mine is, oh yeah? Mm -hmm. Let's see the fruit of that. Let's see the fruit. Church, I hope you're blessed. I didn't mean to go this long, but almost an hour, but has this blessed you? Yes. I want you to understand who you are in Christ. And you're getting ready to be a part of the great army of God in these last days that's going to kick the devil's butt and bring forth righteousness and take people out of darkness into light that's going to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to see cities saved. We're going to see the church unified. We're going to see God exalted on the earth like never before. And you can say, well, I don't believe that. I don't care if you believe it or not. You will believe it one day because you'll be like Thomas and say, my God and my Lord. <laughs> yes, yes, they were right. Yes. And it'll take you past your wounds and your doubts and your unbelief and your hurts. And when things are supposed to happen, they didn't happen. Things are supposed to happen now. They're not happening. When you get past that. And say, God, I don't care how I feel. I don't care how it looks. I don't care anything. I want Jesus. I want to take Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I want to live for him because he lives in me. I want to live in him. I want to live the life that he put in me. I want to live by the Holy Spirit. I don't care how my body feels. I don't care how my bank account looks. I don't care if everybody hates me. I don't care because I'm in love with the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I'm going to stay in love with him. And I'm not going to let any anything, take me out of that love position. You make that kind of a commitment and the Lord Jesus will reveal himself to you like you've never known him. He will empower you and strengthen you. Then it's not about, does your gift operate? It's not about that anymore. It's about Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the son of the living God who happens to live in you and you live in him and his love for you is immeasurable.
That's good news. Amen. Now I want to qualify this and I'm going to quit. When you put that kind of trust in him, I believe healing's coming like we've never seen. Deliverance and blessing like we've never seen. But it's not for us. It's for the world. So praise God. All right, Father. <laughs> I had none of this plan, but Lord, you know what you were doing. Thank you that you're making this body, people are listening. You're making us a Gideon's army who is totally, radically, 100% in love with Jesus. Father, that we kiss your son. Holy Spirit, that we obey you. We love you. We love your word. We, in fact, we tremble at your word. You said, who's going to come up into the burning? Those who have clean hands and a pure heart and tremble at your word. And Lord, you know that I, even this morning, said, Lord, do I really tremble at your word? Do I really have clean hands and a pure heart, Lord? Examine me. Holy Spirit, be satisfied by causing this body to do what you've been sent to do, and that is to be like Jesus and to glorify Father. Holy Spirit, that we don't grieve you or quench your working in our midst. That you can come into this place with a divine smile of heaven because you found a people that will obey you and allow you to change us from glory to glory. Experience your love and grace for us. Knowing that we're an imperfect vessel that your perfection has been put into. Help your people to understand you're not upset. You're not mad. You're not angry. You want to help them to be everything Jesus purchased them to be, that our Father's heart is satisfied. Lord, fill this place with hurting, dying, needy people. Fill it with people that might be on the top of the world. Doesn't matter. But make us a body that can minister the gospel to them and not hurt them, not damage them by any type of a church culture. But they come into this place and they find the kingdom of God here. I look forward, Lord. I hope you do it quickly for everybody being healed because of a, such an atmosphere of heaven here. No division, no strife, no flesh. Just the people that love Jesus and are totally committed to him, even unto the death. Make it so, Father, in Jesus' name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want to say this to you, to the worship team. The Lord is very satisfied because of your unity, as your declaration of your worship, one person, the Lord Jesus, to the audience of one. But because you've been faithful and fruitful, God's going to increase heavenly anointing of worship on you. God's going to increase as you sing with the choirs of heaven, the angels. And the, he's going to increase you and increase you because it's going to be out of worship that much of the healing will come. It's going to be out of worship that the atmosphere will change. And God will do in a moment with his presence that a thousand sermons could ever accomplish. But this grace is upon you, worship team. And this grace is upon us, church, to enter into that worship. 
Because that creates the atmosphere for glory to dwell. And it's a place where self dies and, and we live in the ocean of God's presence. God's doing something here. So don't let worship be a song service in your heart. But enter into the worship that the worship team's getting even deeper into. God's after something. The place where his glory can dwell. And he's making us those who will host his glory. Who will love his glory. And reverence him. It says we worship him in awe of who he is. So I'm expecting that to get stronger and stronger. It'll move to a 24-hour situation. And we'll all become worshipers. I'm telling you, the kingdom of God has come to take us out of the church culture into the kingdom rule of God. I can see this place full of people and the worship team's flowing and then the worship team out here starts to flow. Someone starts to sing. Someone sings in the spirit. All of it orchestrated by the Holy Spirit. Tuning us his instruments of worship. And if we'll only open our heart to him, that's all he asks. We'll see a supernatural flow like we've never known. I've seen it in the spirit. I saw it 45 years ago in the spirit. And we're moving into that day. We're moving into that time and that hour for God to do what only God can do. And for a people that will let him do it. That's not a hard formula, is it? Maybe. Well, Father, we bless you.